Over the centuries, followers of Shankara, Ramanuja, and Madhva have argued about the ultimate nature of reality, the nature of Brahman. Some of their arguments were surprisingly combative and vehement. They used sophisticated logic like a weapon to tear apart conclusions held by their opponents. And they erected fortresses of facts to defend their own positions. These scholarly battles began many centuries ago, and they continue even today. Towards the end of this presentation, we'll discuss several ways to resolve all this divisiveness. The teachings of Shankara, Ramanuja, and Madhva are all based on the very same foundation. They all come from the inspired discoveries of the rishis, ancient sages like Bhrigu, Vasishta, and Yajnavalkya. Their remarkable wisdom was collected in Sanskrit scriptures called Upanishads. The main Upanishads are found at the very end of each of the four sacred Vedas. So that body of wisdom has come to be known as Vedanta. Vedanta is based not only on the Upanishads, but also on the famous Bhagavad Gita and on a highly analytical text, the Brahma Sutras. But the problem is, all of these scriptures are subject to being interpreted in various ways. In the 8th century, there lived a young spiritual genius from Kerala named Shankara, also known as Adi Shankara or Shankara Acharya. He interpreted those scriptures according to a strictly non-dual point of view, Advaita. Then, in the 11th century, came Ramanuja, who was a free-thinking and somewhat rebellious spiritual teacher from Tamil Nadu. He completely rejected Shankara's interpretations of the scriptures as being far too extreme, too radical. Ramanuja reinterpreted the scriptures according to his own perspective, a perspective known as qualified non-dualism, or Vishishta Advaita. Later yet, in the 13th century, came Madhva, or Madhvacharya, who was a pious monk from Karnataka. Madhva rejected the philosophically complex interpretations of both Shankara and Ramanuja, and instead he advocated a simpler interpretation of the scriptures, an interpretation based on dualism, Dvaita. Each of these great scholars wrote elaborate Sanskrit commentaries on the Upanishads, on the Bhagavad Gita, and on the Brahma Sutras. In those commentaries, they each firmly established their own interpretations and thoroughly refuted the interpretations of others. Let me try to summarize very briefly the main differences between their perspectives. First of all, Shankara taught that Brahman, the underlying reality because of which everything exists, has no attributes or qualities whatsoever. Brahman is an absolute, transcendent reality, beyond the world, beyond all creatures, and even beyond Ishvara, God, who created all this. For Shankara, the world is not as real as Brahman. It is mitya, consisting merely of names and forms, like a pot that's merely a name and form of clay. Shankara taught that Atma, the true inner self, is utterly non-separate from Brahman. When this truth goes unrecognized due to ignorance, you become subject to suffering. Liberation is gained by discovering that Atma is not separate from Brahman, and this knowledge puts an end to all suffering, both in this lifetime and thereafter. 
According to Ramanuja, the ultimate reality is Brahman as Lord Vishnu, who possesses limitless power and infinite divine attributes. Attributes like being creator of the world and source of blessings. Ramanuja considers the world to be as real as Lord Vishnu. The world is a material or physical aspect of Lord Vishnu, his physical body, so to speak. For Ramanuja, the inner self of each person is a tiny part of Lord Vishnu's infinite divine being. Atma is like a little glowing spark emitted by a huge blazing fire. Liberation is gained by surrendering to Lord Vishnu and reaching him after death. According to Madhva, the ultimate reality is Lord Vishnu as a personal god who is separate from the world and its beings. Madhva famously taught five kinds of separateness or difference. Difference between material things, Difference between material things and Atma, or soul. Difference between material things and Lord Vishnu. Difference between individual souls. And difference between each soul and Lord Vishnu. For Madhva, liberation is gained through intense devotion. Devotion that invokes Lord Vishnu's grace and saves you from suffering in one life after another. That's a lot of information. To make it a bit easier to grasp, here's a simple way to visualize these three different perspectives. In Advaita Vedanta, Brahman alone exists. All else is merely name and form. In Vishishta Advaita, Lord Vishnu exists along with the material world and individual souls, all of which are parts or aspects of Lord Vishnu, parts that are not separate from him. In Dvaita Vedanta, Lord Vishnu exists along with the material world and individual souls, all of which are completely separate or different from each other and from Lord Vishnu. Now, this comparison is extremely brief, and it omits many important details about each of the three teachings. Not only that, but it completely omits several other kinds of Vedanta that are perhaps less prominent, but they're equally important. They're based on other interpretations of the scriptures, interpretations by Yadava Prakasha, Nimbarka, Vallabha, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Obviously, we can't discuss all their teachings here, but that's really not the purpose of this presentation. The purpose is to understand why the followers of Shankara, Ramanuja, and Madhva have argued so stridently with each other over the ages. Why is there so much divisiveness among them? In general, divisiveness of any kind can be harmful. Divisiveness between racial, social, and religious groups has led to terrible problems in the world. Problems like discrimination, terrorism, and war. Divisiveness between liberals and conservatives here in the United States has weakened our social fabric and even threatens to destroy the unity of our nation. And divisiveness among the followers of Shankara, Ramanuja, and Madhva can result in harm to modern spiritual seekers. How? Let me tell you a story. Decades ago, I used to teach at my guru's ashram in Pennsylvania. One day, after I finished teaching a class, 
a young woman from an Indian family approached me and said, These teachings are wonderful. I wish my parents could come here. I asked, Where do your parents live? She said, Not far, but they would never come here. Why not? I asked. She said, Because my parents come from a traditional Vaishnava community in Tamil Nadu. She went on to explain that before coming to the U.S., her parents used to attend lectures by teachers from the Vashishta Advaita tradition of Ramanuja. In those lectures, her parents were strictly warned to always avoid the teachings of Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. Another example of this kind of divisiveness is found in ISKCON, the organization of the modern Hare Krishna movement. ISKCON is associated both with Madhva's Dvaita Vedanta and with the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Teachers and members of ISKCON often vilify Shankara, accusing him of being a Mayavadi, one who claims that God is a mere illusion. These examples are not meant to criticize anyone, but rather to show how spiritual seekers are sometimes restricted or prohibited from freely searching for answers to their questions in Hinduism's vast ocean of spiritual wisdom. That kind of freedom is actually central to the Hindu tradition. After all, Hinduism allows you to worship any form of God, any form you choose. Hinduism also allows you to worship God in many ways, with or without a particular form, in a temple or on a home altar, in a sacrificial fire, or even in nature. The Hindu tradition acknowledges that every person is different and has different religious preferences and different spiritual needs. This recognition is a central principle of Hinduism, a principle called Adhikari Bheda, the Bheda or difference between Adhikaris, spiritual seekers. We'll come back to this important point later. The fact is, many religious organizations discourage or even prohibit their members from exploring teachings that lie outside the beliefs and doctrines they officially accept. These organizations often claim that such prohibitions are necessary, necessary to protect their members by shielding them from conflicting ideas and harmful influences that could cause confusion or dissension. Perhaps that's true in some situations. But it's also likely that those prohibitions are actually intended to protect the organizations, not their members. Most organizations want to grow stronger, so naturally they want to retain their members and discourage any of them from leaving. So, does this explain the apparent divisiveness among followers of Shankara, Ramanuja, and Madhva who have criticized each other so vehemently? Are they like modern religious organizations, trying to protect themselves or shield their students from different ideas? Somehow, that seems very doubtful. For example, consider Madhva himself, who once criticized Shankara as being a prachanna bauddha, a Buddhist in disguise. Was his criticism really for the sake of restricting his students or protecting his organization? Well, it seems much more likely that Madhva, being such a wise teacher, would have fully embraced the principle of Adhikari Bheda, 
so he would have clearly understood that his teachings of Dvaita Vedanta would be helpful for some students, but not for everyone. For this reason, it seems extremely unlikely that a great saint like Madhva would want to intellectually restrict his students or keep them from leaving, as do many modern religious organizations. Then why did Madhva apparently condemn Shankara as being a Buddhist in disguise? Well, all great scholars like Madhva frequently use a powerful teaching technique known as Purvapaksha Siddhanta. It's a bit like the devil's advocate position, sometimes used in arguments. Purvapaksha means an opposing point of view. It's a contrary perspective that a teacher deliberately introduces into a discussion. After showing the merits of the opposing point of view, the teacher then thoroughly refutes it by showing all of its defects. Defects like logical errors and erroneous assumptions. In this way, the teacher establishes the Siddhanta, the final conclusive point of view, and endows it with much more strength and clarity. This technique uses comparison and contrast in an extremely effective manner. Shankara, Ramanuja, Madhva, and their followers all made frequent use of Purvapaksha Siddhanta. They did so not to criticize opposing teachings, but to strengthen and clarify their own. This technique is widely used in texts, in commentaries, and even in lengthy arguments that span several centuries. A famous example of this began when a brilliant follower of Madhva named Vyasa Tirtha wrote a text in which he meticulously refuted Shankara's Advaita. In response, one of the greatest teachers in Shankara's lineage, Madhusudana, wrote his famous Advaita Siddhi, in which he refuted line by line everything written by Vyasa Tirtha. Then, a disciple of Vyasa Tirtha wrote a powerful rebuttal to Advaita Siddhi. And later, that rebuttal was itself thoroughly refuted by a disciple of Madhusudana. My own guru often used this technique. When he would introduce other religious or spiritual teachings and discuss their shortcomings, some listeners would get upset. They felt, how could this great teacher of Advaita Vedanta be so antagonistic towards others? But his criticisms were never directed at people. He was criticizing their ideas, ideas that he used as purvapakshas to strengthen and clarify his own teachings. The point here is that when truly great teachers criticize other points of view, their goal is not to be divisive or condemn others, nor is it to intellectually restrain their students or keep them from leaving. Instead, their goal is to teach with as much clarity as possible. But I have to admit that not all teachers live up to this lofty standard. Some teachers really feel that their teachings are the best, the most correct, and that all other teachings are somehow defective. Even in my own lineage, I sometimes hear such sentiments. To me, it sounds like Vedantic chauvinism. Okay, this has been quite a serious discussion 
So let's lighten it up a bit with a story that shows how we can reconcile the teachings of Advaita, Vishishta Dvaita, and Dvaita. It's a story about three sadhus, three monks who were trained in the lineages of Madhva, Ramanuja, and Shankara, respectively. One day, they went to the seashore. Standing in the sand, the first sadhu, who was a follower of Madhva, said to the others, Look at the vast ocean. See how every wave is born from the ocean, sustained by the ocean, and eventually returns to the ocean. That's exactly how Madhva described the relationship between individual souls and Lord Vishnu. And see how each wave is different from all the others and different from the ocean itself. That's like Madhva's famous doctrine of difference. And see how waves depend on the ocean for their existence, but the ocean exists independent of the waves. That's like Madhva's teaching that every soul depends on Lord Vishnu for its existence, but the Lord himself is independent of his creation. The other two sadhus listened carefully. Then the second sadhu, a follower of Ramanuja, described the ocean quite differently. He said, I understand your perspective, but as you can see, every single wave is a small part of the ocean. The vast ocean possesses countless waves, just like Lord Vishnu possesses countless divine attributes, as Ramanuja said. And each wave is a tiny part of the vast ocean, just like each soul is a tiny spark of Lord Vishnu's infinite divinity. All the waves are attributes or aspects of the ocean, just like the world and souls are all various aspects of Lord Vishnu, as Ramanuja taught us. After a long pause, the third sadhu, a follower of Shankara, said to the others, What each of you said doesn't make any sense to me. What? they exclaimed. Don't you see all the waves? What waves are you talking about? he said. Don't you see the ocean? they asked. What ocean? he said. Then what do you see? they asked. Water, he said. I see only water. Here there is water alone. Just like Shankara said that all that exists is Brahman alone. The three sadhus on the beach went on arguing late into the night. Who do you think won the argument? None of them. Each sadhu was right from his own perspective. All three explanations were correct from their respective points of view. Arguing about which is right or wrong ends up being counterproductive. As long as the sadhus continued to argue, they couldn't enjoy the beauty of the vast ocean. The same is true for arguments about Advaita, Vishishta Advaita, and Dvaita. Each of these three can be considered correct from its own point of view. Arguing about them only entangles you in a web of words and logic that ultimately prevents you from appreciating the beauty of the absolute reality, however you might consider it. Now, to conclude this presentation, I'd like to share with you a personal theory about how these three different Vedantic perspectives came about in the first place. 
since it's just my personal theory, you don't have to accept it as being true. Also, please remember that I've been trained in the teachings of Advaita, so my perspective will naturally be biased. This theory is based on the fact that among the three major Vedantic teachings, Advaita historically came first, followed by Vishishta Dvaita, and later yet by Dvaita. To me, it makes sense that Advaita came first, since it seems to most accurately represent the overall intent of the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Brahma Sutras. No doubt you can find many passages in those scriptures, especially in the Bhagavad Gita, that support Vishishta Advaita and Dvaita. But when you take those scriptures as a whole, their main focus really seems to be Advaita. Yet the teachings of Advaita are extremely lofty and can be quite difficult to grasp. As a result, these teachings can remain beyond the reach of many sincere spiritual seekers. Now consider this. The goal of every teacher is not just to teach, but to teach in a way that's helpful to his or her students. I can imagine teachers long ago struggling to convey the highest, most elusive teachings of Advaita and completely failing to make their students understand. Some teachers would probably try to make their teachings more accessible, easier for their students to grasp. They might have modified or revised their teachings, creating what's now known as Vishishta Advaita. But even Vishishta Advaita could be too difficult for some students to fully comprehend, so Later teachers might have simplified it even further, creating the teachings we now call Dvaita. By saying all this, I don't mean to suggest that a Dvaita is superior to the other two, or that Dvaita is inferior in any way. It would be ridiculous to suggest that calculus is superior to algebra, or that multiplication is inferior to them both. These are different subject matters, and each subject matter is intended to meet the needs of different students. And that brings us back to the important principle of adhikari bheda, the difference of spiritual seekers. Advaita, Vishishta Advaita, and Dvaita can be understood as being intended for three different groups of seekers. Each is meant to meet the spiritual needs of all those who can fully comprehend and benefit from its teachings. But none of this suggests that one teaching is better than another. After all, the ultimate purpose of these three teachings is not to impart philosophical or spiritual principles. Their purpose is to address the problem of human suffering. And all three can most certainly bless their followers with tremendous spiritual growth and inner peace. Yeah.